Who were your other heavy metal heroes, whether it's a bass or elsewhere? Gene Hoagland, playing with Gene, like Martin said, that's the creativity that comes out of him is amazing. It's like when when we ever have a, a new monitor man or, or something and I, I need my mix, changing my ears, I, I always have to remind the guy, you know, put the toms in my mix. You know, most, you know, usually the guitar players, are the singer, they just want kick snare. They just want the, the basic kick snare. But for me playing with Gene, I need those toms there because that's the link of the conversation between the bass and drums. He's very vocal. Like when he's mm. playing, you can you can hear the melodies in in his in his stuff, and that's what I'm linking to. It's it's easy enough in a band like Testament to to just stay on the kick and snare. That's kind of instinctual, and it just happens, you know. But yeah. being a meandering bass player, when I have those toms, then all the stuff that I'm floating around with in between the guitars makes sense because it that's kind of where the the conversation is linked right there. Yeah. How, how did your like uh, the way you play together when you play in a band like Testament versus Death? Death. How does uh, the the playing between you like how does that change? Well, there's a little bit more rules with Testament. They have their formula, you know, and it's not really up for interpretation. You know, we you know, if you compare what me and Gene play on the older songs that, you know, were done by the original guys, it's it's obviously a little different, but it's it's not a lot different. Where with Death, we have complete artistic license to not only play the songs we didn't record our own way, but we also tend to change the stuff that we did record originally sometimes just evolves together. It's, and, and that comes from, kind of chuck supervision he he never was like a super stickler i mean if we ventured too far he would remind us you know hey i come out of my solo and i don't know where the riff starts like start singing <laughs> you guys pull it back a little but you know besides those nights we got in trouble for going too far he was really open for you know chuck was probably the closest and it's cool he's not here to he's here to hear me say this but because he hated the word jazz, but he was probably the most jazzy type of death metal guy there was because he loved improvisation. He loved experimentation. And clearly by, you know, especially the latter two thirds of the death catalog, he loved people to completely decorate and, and play, you know, all over his riffs. So live was cool with him. So, so, so would you, you, would you even like improvise live? Oh yeah, yeah, a lot. <laughs> a lot. Sometimes too much, and we you got yeah, jazzy. We would, yeah, we would get the cassette. And we didn't know he was, you know. Eventually, we knew he was doing it, but at first, we didn't know he was recording at the soundboard. And we he'd pull the cassette in the bus, and you know, a couple times he'd have it like ready to go. Like, hey guys, um, tonight on the one song, you know, it was just a little loose, and I I lost my place. And if you could, and we're like pulling the old oh what are you talking about you know <laughs> we play it the same way every night and he's all really turns around click on the cassette player uh, right on the spot busted, he's like, right busted, yeah. and then, of course me and gene are just dying laughing because we're that's the first time we heard it you know it's it's so momentary on stage and gene always wore those dark shades and you know he would he plays with a real tall posture and and yeah. when, when we screw around and, and know we were on top of each other i'd always see him looking right down Right at me, I'd turn around and look at the drummer. I'd see him looking at me like, yeah, I got you. I got you. I know what's going on. So, And that was the only real time we we could discuss it, even though it's just pure mental discussion of what, oh, that was funny. Let's, you know, And then all of a sudden, boom, in the bus, we got a cassette lecture. And it's like, we would listen to it and go, oh, wow, that's uh, that's kind of abstract. Yeah. <laughs> but it wasn't. So the, yeah. so the next night we knew we were being scrutinized there and we would tighten it up, man. We played it right on the money. Boom. Chuck was happy. But the trade off is we'd find a different place somewhere a little safer to screw around and try to bend something without the guys getting thrown off. And it was always that challenge like, hey, what about here? Ding, 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 you know, rah, little <laughs> little stuff like that. And, and yeah, he's. It, I could still get him in trouble sometimes. Gene's the type of guy that he could be sitting on his drums totally quiet, like during sound check. You know, maybe the the guitar player's like getting his monitor level, and Gene's sitting there all nice and quiet. And all I got to do is play two or three notes of a riff, you know, from something, you know, Deep Purple or 
or angel witch or something oh, oh picks up his sticks and he's got a i know that riff i know it, and i can always get him in trouble man we are the peanut gallery and and it's just like hey would you two knock it off you know right. yeah stop uh, having it, fun yeah yeah exactly this is a so, metal band no smiling aloud we're here to rock yeah. <laughs> but i mean you know we go way back you know our friendship is you know older than some people's age you know and so <laughs> We, we have that kind of connection where it doesn't it doesn't take very much prompting we're always like ready to snap on the same line so it's pretty cool but yeah i mean during testament it's it's a little bit a little bit more by the rules but um you know that's why i painted that whole story because we're always looking for a way to to you know find where the rules aren't really leaning so hard but uh i want to get those old tapes yeah right <laughs> uh, Chuck's tapes, man. Yeah, actually, I would come home if I ever ended up with him. I would. I don't know why I did this. I would send him to Borvoy, you know, the guy who runs Blabbermouth. He was a. He was just kind of a semi close friend back then, and he had a real early history with Chuck, like way back in the cut off shorts, Florida days, you know, demos, and he he just he had a you know kind of a, a long history with the band and. So I would send them these soundboards because, you know, I would just tell myself like, like I'm going to sit around and listen to my concert I just played. I'm sure I'll never want to hear it again. And um, I'm kind of upset by that because we toured with Carcass one year and and um, and they dedicated a song to me live and I had it on tape and it was cool. I was like, oh, I never had a song dedicated to me, you know, and uh, fucking Borvo has that tape. So probably lost in history. 